thanks so much for coming out today and taking time out of your busy schedule. And I'd like to also thank the college that makes this free flow of ideas possible. So that's great. And I'll do what I can to make it worth your while. And if you could, if you could take out your cell phones and put them on silent. And if you want to share this, it's a Solidify Your Faith Facebook page. You can share it and then your friends can learn what you're learning right now and you'll be able to talk about it. And right now we're doing a series on, uh, it's called Creation Science 101, where we help people uh, solidify their faith in the Bible by looking at science. And we did three talks of these already, or two already, and we'll just do a quick overview. We did Creation Basics, where we looked at two histories, where one history is based on blind chance and random collisions of atoms. Another view of history is based on a creator and a designer. And then we looked at the frameworks and actually saw that the creationists were actually making accurate predictions, whereas the, the big bangers were not. We looked at two definitions, like science, and I just talked about this morning even, a guy said, well, I believe in science. Well, it's like, well, I asked, well, what do you mean by science? And we'd have to get a real good understanding on that word because it's observation and testing. Can you observe it? Can you test it? Is it repeatable? That's what science is. And the Big Bang and evolution is none of that. And so, and then we looked at uh, also evolution, the, uh, the Big Bang. <laughs> evolution, that's molecules to matter. And we don't, our molecules to man, and we don't see that. And then we looked at the laws of physics, and we saw that if you reject the designer and the creator, then you, you basically have to break the first law of thermodynamics to get matter from nothing. The second law, it's got to get more complicated than break down. And we go through more of them, but you can review that on that talk. And then we looked at logical fallacies, such as uh, the appeal to authority, the appeal to, to uh, the majority. And we saw how that wasn't accurate. And then Creation Science 102, we looked at good websites out there where you can find good information. And these are some really good videos. They're one or two minutes long, maybe five minutes long, but very good. And you can check that out because if I give you a fish, you can eat for a day. But if I teach you to fish, you can eat for a lifetime. And that's what this will do, uh, Creation Science 102. But let's jump into Creation Science 103. How old is the Earth? But actually, before we jump into that, uh, did anybody have a birthday last month? Anybody? Oh, you did? Okay. Um, let's see. Do you, can, should we ask how old you are? No, okay, we won't. Um, how do you know how, but do you know how old you are, right? You do, okay. Um, how do you know that? How do you know how old you are? How do you know that was your birthday? Is there a scientific test that we can do that will determine what your birthday is or how old you are? No. So how do you, how, how do you, why do you think yeah, that's your birthday? Um, maybe a, a certificate. A birth certificate? Okay. Did they show you that birth certificate when you were five? No. No. How did you know that was your birthday? I had a birthday party. Yeah, but who did it? How did they know? Parents. Parents. Okay, so somebody who was there, who saw what happened, told you, and you trusted them. And then you also have the, so a trusted source and a historical document. See, how old something is isn't a science question. How old something is is a history question. And so let's just take a look at the age of the Earth. And for those who voted yesterday, I did the old how old is the Earth thing, and we had some people photobombing that. That was pretty cool. But yeah, we did ask this over at the kiosk. Thanks for voting. And how old is the Earth? And it ended up 44 to 9. 44 people thought billions, 12 thought millions, so that's 51, to nine people who saw thousands. And what this basically is, it's a, two views of history. One, again, is based on blind chance, and the other one's based on a creator. And the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And that's what they say. And the, but now, but how old is the universe? And I was just going to focus on the Earth, but if the universe can't be billions of years old, well then clearly the Earth can't be billions of years old. So that says it's 11.4 to 13.8 billion years. Yeah, that's a big range, <laughs> two billion years. Well, how do they come up with that? Well, according to phys.org, the universe might be two billion years younger than they thought. Because at most textbooks say it's 13.8 billion. And how do they figure it out? Well, the scientists estimate the age of the universe by using the movement of stars to measure how fast it's expanding. If the universe is expanding faster, that means it got to its current size more quickly and therefore must be relatively young. So what they do is they look at the stars going away and they run the movie, movie backwards and then they get the Big Bang. 
Okay, but that could also, that same evidence could point to in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and, the, and he stretched out the heavens, like the Bible says. So again, how do they get this? Well, uh, the universe is 13.7 billion years old based on a Hubble constant of 70. So whatever that Hubble constant is, it gives the age of 13.7 billion years. But keep in mind that there's other people, <laughs> they came up with a Hubble constant of 82.4 and the guy gave an age of 11.4 billion. Okay, and then look down at the bottom, other people got a Hubble constant of 67, 74, 73. So this is not an exact science. There's a lot of wiggle room there. And uh, you're not going to be able to keep up with the slides that I'm going to show. So just take down two notes. This is one of them. Creation.com and the age of the earth. You can go in and read this article. It's got 101 evidences for a young age for the earth and the universe. And we're not going to do all 100 of them, but we're going to hit the highlights. And again, if the universe isn't billions of years old, the Earth cannot be billions of years old. And there's the aging of spiral galaxies. You got these galaxies that move around, They're, they got spiral arms. They should be all wrapped up. There shouldn't be any spiral arms in 200 million years. And then also there's the number of type 1 supernova remnants observable. See, the supernovas are when a star explodes, it leaves a gas cloud and uh, it's a supernova remnant. And then they, they expand and you can see how fast they're expanding and then you can determine how old, how, when it expanded, when it blew up. And these type 1 supernovas, there should be billions of them, if not more. <laughs> you know, it's the universe, all these exploding stars got us to where we're at, and we don't see enough of them. And this is from the, the Young Earth, uh, this is by uh, Dr. Henry Morris. This is the Young Earth, and they had a pet PowerPoint in there, and he got his PhD in geology, uh, uh, geological engineering from the University of Oklahoma. And so this is the book he puts out, very educated. And he says there's only about 2,000 remnants seen in our galaxy. And I think that you see one every, I don't know, uh, 30 years or something like that. You can get all those remnants in 7,000 to 14,000 years. Not millions or billions of years. Plus Jupiter and Saturn are radiating, they're losing heat, more heat than they get from the sun. And they can't do that forever. <laughs> you know, it, they're gonna be, it's like the, put a cup of coffee on the table, it's gonna be cold. It's going to be room temperature after a while. And that's what should be happening with Jupiter and Saturn. They just can't keep losing heat forever. Eventually it's going to be cold. So they're not billions of years old. And then you got the existence of short-term comets. And those can only be around for 20,000 years. So why do we see them now? And also long-term comets. And so there's a rescuing device. A rescuing device is something you imagine to be true so you don't have to give up your faith and your belief system of the past. And with those spiral galaxies, they, expect, they thought, they imagined, well, there must be dark matter there that keeps them still <laughs> in spiral arms. And for the expanding galaxy, or the expanding universe, the rate of expansion is accelerating. It's getting faster and faster, and they can't explain it. So they imagine this thing called dark energy. It's like anti-gravity, and it's never been observed. But they need that to explain what they're, what they're seeing. And then with the comets, they invent a, an Oort cloud. Yeah. That's where these new, gal new, com new comets are coming from, the Oort cloud. It's never been observed, it's never been measured. They just have to have it because we have comets. And then there's a magnetic field around Mercury. And if it was that old, that, that magnetic field should be gone, but it's not. And Russell Humphreys says, yeah, this is going to have a field. And he based his projections on a 6,000 year galaxy. And he said that it's going to be, it's going to have a magnetic field and it's going to be declining. And they said, no, it doesn't have a magnetic field. And when they saw that it had one, they said it must be steady. It must have stabilized over this time. He says, no, it's going to be declining. And he was right. The creation was right, creationist was right based on a 6,000-year model. And then there's also the Earth's decaying, and Russell Humphreys, Earth's decaying uh, magnetic field also. And uh, Uranus and Neptune have magnetic fields, but they shouldn't. Uh, they should be long since dead. But he accurately predicted the magnetic strength of Uranus and Neptune based on a 6,000 year model. And it just blows away the blind chancers. And then Ganymede, Io and Europa have magnetic fields. Those are moons of Jupiter. And they shouldn't because they can't have a dynamo because they're not liquid inside. And again, dynamo is another rescuing device. And then there's volcanic activity on Jupiter's Io. It shouldn't have any of that. But if it, at this current rate, or even 10% of that rate, it would have erupted its entire mass 40 times. You know, it, it just can't be there for billions of years. 
And then there's methane on Titan, and that's a real tough one because methane should have all been gone because the UV induced breakdown, and it should have produced photosynthesis that, have, that have, should have produced a huge sea of hydrocarbons such as ethane. And this scientist says that sea of ethane should be 300 to 600 meters thick. That's six football fields stacked up. That's how much ethane there should be there, but it's not, which proves to a, points to a young Earth creation. And then the rate of change of the Saturn's rings, they're falling apart. They're not millions of years, they're not billions of years. There's the moon of Saturn that's spewing massive jets of water vapor and ice particles into space at supernova speeds. But you can see that this is a NASA photograph. It's shooting out water <laughs> at supersonic speeds. You can't do that for billions of years. Okay, now let's get to the Earth. And that's, this is the, I've got a textbook right here from St. Cloud State. And you can come up and look at it if you want when it's over. But this is trying to explain the origin of the Earth. And it says the origin of the geosphere is the story of the birth of our planet. The story begins. See, this book is a story. This is not science. It's a story. And if you miss that at the beginning, you're going to think it's science, but it's a story. And I know a biologist, or I met a biologist in Virginia, and he says when he's teaching biology, he has his kids have a journal that put write down fuzzy words. Fuzzy words, and the big, you know, that's then they can determine if they're learning science or if they're learning a belief system about the past. And here's the most obvious fuzzy word there is. This is from, a, I've got a copy of it here from the biology textbook at St. Cloud State. Somehow, despite this harsh environment, living organisms appeared. Somehow. Somehow is not science. And this is how they explain the origin of life. Somehow. I was talking, we're in the nursing building here, and I was talking to somebody who was learning about the gastrointestine thing today, and I said, you know, we got or vital organs. How did we live before those organs? We can't live without the vital organs. How did we live before they evolved? And he didn't really answer the question, but he believes in evolution. How did scientists calculate the age of the Earth? How do they do that? The age of the rocks is determined by radiometric dating. And so let's look at that. And there's problems with radiometric dating. There's three unknowable assumptions, and we'll get to them. But in this article, <laughs> it says there's a problem with this because rocks are constantly changing between forms, going back and forth from igneous to metamorphic to sedimentary. Old rocks may even be destroyed as they slide back into the Earth's mantle to be replaced by newer rocks formed by solid lava flows. So what they really like is to get a, a moon rock or a meteor. And so what did they find? Anybody know where the oldest, moon, the oldest rock was found? Let's see, where was the Earth's oldest rock found? They just found it. They found it 50 years ago, but they didn't tell us until five years ago. Anybody know? Anybody? No? Okay, it was found on the moon. The Earth's oldest rock was found on the moon. It's like, what? How does a rock from the Earth get to the moon? They say, the evidence that the rock was launched from the Earth by a large impacting asteroid or comet. Do they know that? Can they prove that? And then it goes on to say the rock crystallized about 20 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. So there's a rock that was formed under the surface that got to the moon. How do you explain that? Well, the hydroplate theory explains it perfectly. And I spoke at the University of Northwestern in November, and that came up during the Q&A. They said, what's the hydroplate? <laughs> and so I, I explained it in five minutes. And it's a little hard to find on my YouTube channel, but it'll be easier on my Facebook page. Just go into the hydroplate in five minutes. And that'll show you exactly how a rock formed inside the Earth and ends up on the moon perfectly. You'll understand it in five minutes. And if you're interested in it, I gave an hour talk on it at St. Cloud State that they didn't want us to give. They stole our posters and stuff, but we gave it anyway. And then if you're really interested in this, we had the very first online hydroplate conference last September. And there was three PhDs who spoke, and one of them taught at the, universe, at the US Air Force Academy. And so, yeah, this is a really solid theory, and I'm trying to bring it into the mainstream before NASA makes another catastrophic blunder based on a theory of blind chance and random collisions of atoms. And if you can only watch one of the videos, watch the comet talk about 20 minutes in, you'll be able to see which one has a proper perspective of the past, and it's the creationists. Okay, and as we're talking about the moon, let's talk about the recession of the moon. It's getting farther and farther away. It says it's four centimeters a year. A few thousand years, not a big deal. A few billion years, we got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. And it's a catastrophic proximity. 
but it doesn't say that in your textbooks. This is, I believe, it's uh, eighth grade science. The moon has been moving slowly away from the Earth. It's now moves 3.8 centimeters farther from the Earth each year. How can that be? Yeah, but it doesn't tell you that that can't happen for millions or billions of years, the big problem. And you got the recession of the moon. Yeah, in about 1.4 billion years, that's going to be touching the Earth. And once it's touching the Earth, why would it ever leave the Earth? And they can't even explain how we got the moon. It's really difficult to catch a moon in space. You know, normally things come together and they slingshot around each other. Or if they do get caught, it's going to have a real equal, equal, a really uh, uh, oblong orbit. But ours is pretty, pretty, pretty round. And they've got four theories. You know, they got the dust cloud, the nebula theory, where it came from the same dust cloud, but the materials are too different. They've got another one where it just spun off the Earth, and the Earth can't be spinning that fast. But and plus, the moon doesn't go around the equator of the Earth. It goes on the same plane that we're orbiting the sun. And then there's another one where, let's see if we got this, the collision. We've also got the, where it's the, the, the capture one, which we talked about. It's really hard to do that, and it shouldn't have a circular orbit. And then they've got the collision one, which should vaporize a lot of the, the minerals and elements that we find on the moon. So they've got four theories. None of them work. And they thought the moon's been there for four billion years. They thought it would have billions of years of space dust on it, and it doesn't. The landing pads were added and the legs were lengthened because they, they thought there'd be billions of years of space dust there. And that's why they got the big pad at the bottom, the ladder's 18 inches too short, and it's just you know less than a fraction of an inch of dust up there, which show points to thousands, not billions. And because we had a bad perspective of the past, <laughs> we wasted a lot of money. Yeah, the blind chance theory cost us millions, if not billions, of wasted tax dollars because we had to send up the ranger and the surveyor to figure out that it could have a solid landing. Okay, so now let's move on to the dating method. Radioisotope dating. Uranium decays into lead, and they can measure how fast that happens. It has a half-life, but there's three unknowable assumptions. And they don't know if there's any daughter element in the rock at the beginning. And they also don't know if the decay rate's been constant over millions and billions of years. And they don't know if it's been contaminated. And what contaminates the rocks? Water, groundwater. It can wash elements in and out. That's why we don't have lead pipes today. And to help illustrate this story, we, uh, um, the first two anyway, we got the spaceship story. Just imagine that your only assignment is to figure out how old teenagers are. So you do some good science, you, you measure them. And you find out the average height is 65 inches. And then you measure them for a year and you see that the average growth rate is one inch per year. So that's good observable science, that's facts. And then you make some assumptions and figure, well, they're 65 inches tall, they grow at one inch per year, Teenage, they must be 65 years old. And that's historical assumption, then you made a bad assumption. And so the parents freak out and say, they're not 65, they're teenagers. So you're not really confident in your results. So you'd study them again and you weigh them. The average weight is 130 pounds and they put on two pounds per year. So you figure 130 pounds divided by two and you get 65. So you've measured them twice, got the same answer. So now you're confident that they're 65 years old and you are wrong. Why is that? What went wrong? Well, you assumed the initial condition was zero, and that was wrong. You assumed a constant rate of growth, which was wrong, and you disregarded eyewitness testimony of the parents, which was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. So what's going wrong today? We assume the initial condition of the rock is zero, and we don't know that. We assume there's a constant decay rate, and we don't know that. And we assume the rock hasn't been exposed to water, and we don't know that. And we disregard eyewitness testimony, and I would submit that's the Bible. And there's ways to make conflicting results and tell the same story. See, one experiment is worth a thousand expert opinions. And so let's take a look at what happens. They find fossil wood in a quarry, and it dates to 20,000 years with the carbon-14 method. And yet they find it in rock that's supposed to be 183 million years old. How do you get 20,000-year-old wood in 183 million-year-old rock? That's a tough one. And also diamonds. They got carbon dated for 57,000 years, and they're found in rocks that are one to three billion years old. Again, that's a tough one. And then there's a lava dome at Mount St. Helens. That's my favorite. The rate team went up there, took some of the lava, and sent it to a lab and said, how old is this lava? We think it's rather young. And the lab came back with uh, 350,000 years to 2.8 million years, and it should have just been 10 years. 
So again, one experiment is worth a thousand expert opinions. And when we know the age of the lava, the dating, the dating measures don't work. The dating age doesn't work. For example, this one should have been 200 years, but it came back at 600,000. This one should have been 29 years, and it came back at 35 million. Again, less than 200 years, and it was 21 million. And then the rock was 40 years old, but it tested at 8.5 million. And again, this rock was 200 years old, and it tested out at 22 million. So there's problems with that radiometric dating. When we know the age of the rock, it doesn't work. So why should we believe it when the age of the rock is unknown? Okay, moving on. You get the different faces of the same zircon crystal giving different ages. You know, they're the same crystal. They should have the same age, but they get different ones, according to uh, the, uh, the PhD guy from Oklahoma. And then you also find carbon-14 and coal and oil and fossil wood and diamonds. And even in dinosaurs, they found carbon-14 in them. So dinosaurs are not millions of years old, according to the scientific method. And also the decay rate of the Earth's magnetic field. We mentioned this before. They've been measuring it since 1835. And about, uh, it has a half-life of 1,400 years. So 1,400 years ago, it was twice as strong. 1,400 years from now, it's going to be half as strong. And eventually, we're not going to have one. And then the, it's not going to protect us from the radiation from the sun. It can only get twice as strong up until about 10,000 years. Then it would have been so strong that the planet would have disintegrated into metallic core and would have separated from its mantle. The inescapable conclusion is that the Earth must have been fewer than 10,000 years old. And the Earth's magnetic field is losing its energy too fast. And then also a problem is there's, you don't find the plant fossils with the animals. You get a whole bunch of animals, but what were they eating? It doesn't make sense. You know, the Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon has many trackways. Those are footprints. And, but it's uh, devoid of plants. These rocks are not ecosystems of an era buried in situ over eons of time of, as evolutionists claim. The evidence is more consistent with catastrophic ta transportation than burial. Because you find land animals with the, with the reptiles, with the fish, with the clams, all in one area. It's a big cement mixer. It's just a worldwide flood. And, and how else do you explain a land animal <laughs> with like a, like a sea animal? OK, and then you get polystrate fossils. These are fossils that are per, per, usually vertical. And they go through several layers of strata, of rock strata, polystrate. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a tree that they found in a coal mine in Tennessee. I should have put the slide in, but it's coalified and petrified and coalified. And these two coal seams are supposed to be tens of thousands of years different. It doesn't make sense. And here's a tree from Quinn Road Baptist Church in Lake Zurich. That's a fossil tree. Well, it's a tree that got squished. Carl Baugh found this, and he donated it to the church. And that bark is coalified and then petrified and also fibrous, all on the same tree. So that's a real hard one to explain with millions and billions of years. OK, and then there's thick, tightly bent strata without a sign of melting or fracturing. And this is Mike Snavely. He spoke last month down at the University of Northwestern and uh, did a great talk. And you can see this on the Twin Cities Creation Science Association YouTube channel. You can see his talk. And he talks about, uh, during Q&A, I asked him if he went to uh, Arches National Park to, and asked about the dinosaur, to see the dinosaur carving. And he said, no, it wasn't Arches National Park. It was the Natural Bridges National Monument. And he said he called him up, and he wanted to take a photograph. And he asked, what's the best time of day to take a picture of that? And the receptionist won't tell him. She said, you got to talk to the head ranger. So he's talking to the ranger, and the ranger blurts out, that's a level, he said, the, the artifact you're looking to photograph will be best photographed at 1.30 on that time of year. And then he said, I've exceeded my authority. <laughs> and Mike says, what's that mean? How do you exceed your authority? He said, that's a level three artifact. So Mike asks, well, what's a level three artifact? He said, well, level one is what we tell people about. Level two is what we'll tell them about if they ask us. And level three is if they, is, uh, they have to pretend they don't exist. So that's what's happening with our tax money. But these bent layers, these layers are supposed to be laid down millions of years. How do you bend rock like that? And how did this rock get slanted and even pushed up like that? 
And again, the bent rock, how can that get laid down over millions of years? Again, the hydroplate theory explains it. It's not millions of years. There's a bunch of mud, the continents are sliding, they run into resistance, they buckle up and the mud bends and then it turns to rock. That's the only way you can explain it. And then you got paraconformities. It's where one rock layer sits upon another rock layer, but there's supposed to be millions of years of other rock in between them. And the classic example is the Coconino sandstone sitting on the Hermit Shale in the Grand Canyon. And there's, according to the geologic column, there's 10 million years that are missing. And it's just a knife edge. Just a knife edge. There's no erosion. What, there wasn't erosion for 10 million years? See, that geologic column has a lot of problems. And what they don't tell you is the, ge the Grand Canyon's missing seven of the 12 layers. If you notice that, that the layer down here, where did those layers go? Yeah, maybe these got washed off with erosion, but where did those two layers go? That's a problem. And they just have to sweep it under the rug. And then there's a lack of bioturbation. You know, when there's uh, the, at the surface of the earth, there's gophers, there's worms, there's insects, there's, uh, you know, chipmunks, there's badgers. You know, people, there's, an, there's insects and animals that are stirring up the topsoil. But when you look at the Coconino sandstone, you don't see it at all. It's just one solid rock with nothing messing with it. And then you've got Arches National Park. That's my favorite. Arches National Park. They've got uh, 2,000 rock bridges there, and they're collapsing at a rate of one per year. So at this rate, they should all be gone in 2,000 years. But where are they being formed at the rate of one per year? And that's what Dr. Randy Galusa would ask. Yeah, we see them falling apart, but where are they being formed? See, something was totally different in the past. We can't use uniformitarianism, the present is the key to the past explanations anymore, because we don't see any arches being formed. Okay, and you can, if you want to hear a radio show about this, this is Real Science Radio, rsr.org, and it's got a list of collapsing natural bridges, and it's documents. He's got dozens of them that you can look at. One of them was uh, Darwin's arch collapsed. Another one was the Apostle Arch, one of the Apostle apart, uh, uh, the Apostle Arches collapsed, and he put in parentheses, probably Judas. And, but so that's one of my favorite. And also there's not enough salt in the sea. I was talking to a woman yesterday, she stroked underneath 6,000 years, and I asked her, why did you do that? And she said, well, I've done my research. And I said, like what? And she said, there's not enough salt in the sea for millions of years. <laughs> that's a sharp, sharp woman there, sharp girl. There's not enough salt in the sea, there's not enough sediment in the sea for millions of years either. And this says the evidence for a young sea, all the salt in the ocean would accumulate to, a max, to its maximum of 62 million years. And then also there's uh, the present rate, all the sediments in the ocean would accumulate to no, in no more 14 million. So it's not billions of years old. In the Mississippi Delta, <laughs> it says there's 80,000 tons an hour gets washed, of sediment gets washed into that delta. So if that was going for millions of years or billions of years, that Gulf of Mexico should be full by now, but it's not. They got roughly 30,000 years to accumulate the mud in the delta. And I'll say, well, that's, that's more than the 6,000 year that, years that the Bible says. Well, I think a whole lot of it came off when the flood of Noah's Ark was, was draining off the continents. So you had a lot of coming, a lot, and now it's just, uh, now it's steadied out there. And then there's flume tank research with sediments of different particle sizes show that layered rocks of strata were thought to have occurred over millions of years, actually formed very quickly. And that's what uh, John Morris, I think there's a flume thing in St. Paul where they watched the Mississippi River, and he saw that those layers in the river were being put down all at once, and that made him think about a flood model. And we saw that at Mount St. Helens. There was the eruption, and you, you see these finely layered sediments laid out as they were being pushed along. And then there's biological evidence for a young age of the Earth. Lack of 50-50 racemization of amino acids in fossils. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that you have to understand the chorality problem. See, these amino acids can form in a left-handed or a right-handed molecule. And if you're alive, all the amino acids and pro that make up the proteins, they're all left-handed. But once you die, they go into a breakdown to a 50-50 mix. So if things have been dead for millions of years, it should be 50-50, but it's not. And <clears throat> all the amino acids and proteins are left-handed, while all the sugars and DNA and RNA are in the right-handed. And how does that happen by chance? No, we were designed intelligently. And you got living fossils. You got jellyfish, grapolites, and uh, Carl Werner just got a whole book of them. 
horseshoe crabs, everything. And it's like if they're living, how come they haven't evolved? You know, the, and that's, a, that's another talk for another time, but he figured if evolution is true, he tried to prove evolution true. That's what he, he believed in evolution, but you can't prove it true, but you can falsify it. So his theory, or his hypothesis was, if evolution is false, the modern animals will look identical to their fossil ancestors because no evolution took place over those millions of years. Guess what? That's what he found. The modern animals were looked identical to the uh, fossil ancestors. And so, yeah, there wasn't any evolution. And then also there's index fossils that are used to date the layer of rock, like the wallamy pine and the coelacanth. If you found a coelacanth in a layer, that was 65 million years old. Well, how do you know that layer was 65 million years old? Because everyone knows the dinosaurs and the coelacanths died 65 million years ago. And yet they're still alive today. So they, they date the rocks with the fossils and the fossils with the rocks. So that's a circular reasoning, should not work. And then we got the mutation rate of mitochondria Eve. It points back to 6,000 years. Ann Gibbons, you can check out her writing. 6,000 years is what she came up with. And then they threw in some chimp DNA to push it back into the millions. Then we find dinosaur blood cells, blood vessels, proteins, and also nerves in dinosaur bones, and they can't last millions of years. They cannot. So how do you get something that can't be millions of years old and something that's supposed to be millions of years old? And I'd say the dinosaurs are not millions of years. They cannot be. And then there's pressure in oil and gas welds. It should have leveled out by now, but it's not. It can have up to 20,000 pounds per square inch, and it should only hold that for 10,000 years. So there's a lot of pressure in there, and it shouldn't be. Erosion of Niagara Falls, we'll talk about that tomorrow night at the public library. We'll be talking there at 7 p.m. And then the river delta growth rate. We also looked at the Mississippi one already. And then underfit streams, river valleys that are too large for the streams, like the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. And then observed examples of rapid canyon formation and also rapid formation of islands. Here's the canyon. Look at that little Toodle River in the bottom there. If we didn't see that canyon form, people would say it took that little Toodle River, you know, millions of years to cut that canyon. But that canyon was 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep, and that happened in nine hours. We saw it happen. It was a big mud flow carbon through there. See, the river didn't make the canyon. The canyon made the river. But if we didn't see that happen, we'd use that to promote 6,000 years. And then there's an island out on, by Surtsis in Iceland. How old do you think that island is? It started forming in 1963. I got some brothers and sisters that are older than that island. They're actually older than the hills. And in one week's time, they can witness changes that elsewhere might take decades or even centuries. So things can happen rapidly. And there's some more pictures, and it says that uh, geologists marvel that canyons, gullies, and other land features that typically take tens of thousands or millions of years can form less than a decade. So things that look old aren't old. And this is TP Fountain uh, down at Thermopolis. In 1903, a guy had a rock garden. There was wow, a spring coming out of the ground, so he put a pipe on that spring. And guess what it turned into? That was 1998. His neighbors got one, too. So rocks, can, minerals can form. You can make these mineral deposits quickly, not over millions of years. And I just bring up ice cores because that's what was brought up. I was at St. Cloud State. They used brought up ice cores. Yeah, it's uh, over tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old based on ice cores. They think they're annual rings, and they're not. And we can prove it because there was a, in World War II, there's a, a squadron was running out of fuel. They had to make an emergency landing in Greenland. And the first one went down with his wheels down, and he kind of, he had a big crash. And so the next one came down with just on their bellies, and they landed. And the guys walked out of there. And then somebody wanted to go get those, those planes. They figured you'd go out there and sweep the snow off the wings and fly them away. But what he didn't realize is that they were under 75 meters, 250 feet of ice. And they, they got them up, but there was hundreds. And Ken Hovind talked to the people that excavated it and got it out of there. And he says, how can you have hundreds of layers of ice in only 40 some years? And he says, those aren't annual rings, those are warmer, 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 colder, warmer, colder. It's not annual. Then also the tree ring dating is also fraudulent. They did a research, and you can listen to this in rsr.org also, and the bristlecone pine tree, they can get more than one ring per year. And they did a, a test, 
multiple rings per year. You can read about this in creation.com, where if they simulate a drought for two weeks and give it water again, it'll make a ring. So you can have multiple rings per year. And it's a real unexact science because even trees growing at the same time will have different ring patterns, especially if they're like on the edge of the forest or in the middle, because on the edge, they're going to have more rings because the soil's not so good. Okay, so that's what we did. We took a look at creation science. How old is the earth? Well, it's, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just giving you information, and then you can see if that information is true. Check it out for yourself. Don't believe it just because I said so. Basically, it's a perception of the past. Do we believe in, in chance random processes, or do we believe in a designer? And this is a Grace Campus Fellowship event. And what we do at Grace Campus Fellowship is we try to reach the students. We try to give them good information, help them make good friends, because if you make the bad friends here, it could be tough. And we also like to help them know what the Bible says about going to heaven. And we like people to realize that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. That's bad news. We're all sinners. We all deserve hell. But the good news is uh, there's a gift of God, and that's eternal life. Do you have eternal life? If you were to die today, where would you go? And I talk to a lot of students, and they th think they have to do something to get to heaven. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, it's not what we've done. Jesus already did the work for us. We just need to believe that he did that, that he died on a cross. I mean, this is the gospel, but that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That was 1 Corinthians uh, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 3, and 5. And then also, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So have you believed the gospel? Are you saved from hell? Have you believed that? And this is the most important question in the Bible. Uh, Acts 16, 30 and 31. And the jailer asks Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they could have told him anything. Do this, do that, stop doing this, stop doing that. But they didn't. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Have you believed? And everybody knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, that's great news. But two verses later it says, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he hasn't believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So Jesus divides the whole world into two groups, those who believe and those who don't. Some of those are not condemned because they believe, but then the ones who are condemned, there's the ones who don't believe. And so that's why we're here. And uh, what we'd really like to do is give a creation club. Get a creation club or a Grace Campus going here and at the technical college here. Because our perspective is you need to get all the information so you can think. You know, you need to get all. But it's that, are you, getting, are you allowed to think about a creator or a designer in class? You know, it's like that saying, beware of one hand clapping. You know, there's two sides to every story. But if you only hear one side over and over again, it's probably because the other side is being censored. And until you see both sides of the story, you don't really have an informed conclusion. It's more of a directed conclusion. So if you want to help people get all the information on, camp, on campus, hopefully in the big room, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. And with that, I sh um, some things that are coming down the pike. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be speaking at St. Cloud State or I mean at the St. Cloud Public Library at 7 p.m. We'd love for you to come back. And now we're going to talk about the age of the earth, and we're going to show how the Bible gets 6,000 years. And I've never seen, what I'm going to show you tomorrow night, I've never seen anybody do. And uh, we're going to get right up to 600 B.C. instead of jumping from Abraham to Jesus. We're going to get up to Nebuchadnezzar. So anyhow, hopefully, um, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging around. We should probably let you guys go if you have to get to class. And with that, thank you so much for your attention.